Hey gang, part two of three in our little mini mindset series. And today we bring you Olympic gold medal champion and Australian icon, Kerry Podhast in this part two, showing us how to get our mindsets in check, ignite your gold medal performance uh, with the six inches between our ears. Here's part two, this is Kerry Podhast. You want the normal real estate training you've been told a million times, make cold calls, knock on doors, best be switching off now because in this podcast we go out of the box using unknown tactics primarily that the real estate industry has never heard of in order to get you called in more often, convert those listings and get more success without the painful cold call. Listen up, we're in for a ride. This is Real Estate Renegade. And this episode, I'm going to give a special shout out. Let's just say this episode brought to you by Kerry Podhast herself. As a sponsor of this show, uh, Kerry has offered to do a little deal for you guys that if you guys wanted her one-on-one -on -one coaching, aside from the lessons that you learn right now with Kerry, if you want to inquire with Kerry, so it's kerry at kerrypodhast.com. If you want to have Kerry Podhast personally hold your hand through your challenges, take you to those Olympic standards, it would be uh, really, really my wisest of wise counsel for you to take advantage and see she has got a special Real Estate Renegades Glenn Twiddle deal. So do avail yourself of that if you wanted some more information some more hand-holding from the legend Kerry Pothouse. let's go straight to that uh, interview that coaching session that we did now this is gold medalist icon Australian champion Kerry Pothouse. hello good morning how you doing rock star yeah great great gosh how motivational are you you don't oh, need me <laughs> no not at all I'm a rookie Kerry it's it's sitting in the audience listening to people even not even people like you I've sat in the audience and listened to your lessons and it is the cumulative effect of mentors for me. Like none of that I invented. Like I just sort of took, uh, you know, some lessons from Kerry and Nat and what you guys did was incredible. But all of those mentors in all of those books, including someone's book right here that you beautifully autographed for me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the Business of Being an Athlete by Kerry Potter. So all of that learning, I just sort of, the only way I can take credit for it is I implemented what I learned and somehow during that action taking, I kind of maybe take some ownership of it. And I find my own way to implement what you guys taught me, but I certainly, um, yeah, I, I need mentors like you more than, more than anyone if I want to achieve. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, look, it. that's, that's all we all do. We all just take bits and pieces. That's how I learned to play volleyball. Like I looked around at different players and people ask me sometimes like, who did you model yourself on or who do you most um, aspire to be like or whatever? And I go, well, there's not one person. There's a bit of this, a bit of that. And I remember even, you know, one of my great mates, Julian Prosser, who's also a three-time Olympian in beach volleyball. He's a male, obviously. Play, they play a different game to ours. But I just remember one time, you know, setting the ball and going, oh, I felt like Julian then, you know. And I don't want to look like him. He's like six foot three and 120 <laughs> kilos. And But I just, you know, and, and so I guess once you... Um, you know, learn these skills and learn these lessons to create success in your own life, then, you know, and you do it yourself, you eventually, it just becomes who you are. It kind of seeps into your being um, the more and more you practice it. So yeah, it's great to hear the same lessons from different people and how they've applied them from, you know, to their life. But one thing I've got to just say to you, Glenn, you've got to be careful when you say Nat's my, my partner. She's my beach volleyball partner. Oh, okay. well, <laughs> understood. <like> understood. <laughs> yeah, it, it is almost. Well, how is that? How's your relationship gone? Because I've seen that. Um, you know, you guys. Well, you know what? For those of for those who don't know the story, I'm I'm jumping the gun as someone who's been a student of your guys for goodness for twenty years nearly. Tell us the story of uh, from say 1996 and and through to to gold. Yeah, well, obviously, um, Natalie Cook is my beach volleyball, or was my beach volleyball partner for two Olympics. I actually played three Olympics because I retired after we won the gold medal, which I have here. Where is it for those people who like to see a medal oh, through Zoom? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I retired after that and then um, made a quick comeback and played a third Olympics, which a lot of people don't know about. I played with another girl called Summer Lokovic. But Nat and I played two Olympics together. We won um, the bronze, which I do also have, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's just a shiny, actually, if you have a look at it. Yeah. 
put it up against the light. It, you can barely tell the difference. I tell you, light. I'd have bought it if it was if it was the bronze. I'd have thought, oh, nice gold medal. <laughs> well, that's what people used to say to us when we had the bronze medal, and we'd go around and show it after we won it. And you know, people would come up to us say, up to us and say, "Hey, you've won a gold medal," and we'd have to say, "No, nah, it's just a bronze." <laughs> <laughs> oh no! So you know that was when we kind of started going right. We got to get the gold, but obviously um, a lot happened in those four years. You know, we built a great team around us. You know, it's so important to have coaches and people. You know, on your bus. You know, if you've got the wrong people on your bus, kick them off and get the right people on your bus, um, and that bus will take you to where you want to go. But we got a, a vo- we had a volleyball coach already who took us to bronze. Then we looked for somebody who could look after us physically. So. We got a a personal trainer on board with us, um, Phil Morland. And then we thought there was one thing missing. And, you know, it's probably, and well, probably I know now, it is 100% definitely the most important part of success. And that is somebody to help you with your mindset. Because at the end of the day, it's the difference between, you know, winning and losing your best success that you can ever achieve and and not quite achieving it is is your mindset and that that word is thrown around i think really easily i think sometimes people go well mindset what does it actually mean well it means a lot of stuff it just basically means all the work that you do outside of your work all the work that you do off the court or out of the pool or off the field or off the track whatever your sport is if you're a sports person or you know out of office hours it's the work that you do to continually push yourself out of your comfort zone you know to to increase that zone of comfort so eventually you know being uncomfortable is normal which we had to I guess we had to um, feel that that was normal for us being uncomfortable because standing in front of 10,000 screaming Australians you know on Bondo Beach uh, you know 21 years ago 21 years ago um, (laughs) was seriously uncomfortable so we, we continually put ourselves in situations off the court you know, like walking on broken glass, walking on hot coals with our mindset coach to just really push us past that kind of fear barrier and get us used to being a little bit afraid, but doing things anyway. Um, So that's one thing, you know, being uncomfortable. Another thing, mindset, it could just be about helping develop the belief that you have in yourself. And that belief could just be reminding yourself of where you've come from and all the things that you've achieved already and that you're on the right path. You've built a team around you. You've got a plan. All those things help you develop your belief. Um, yeah, and what are, there are so many parts. And also mindset can be, um, you know, building a strong mindset in today's world with what we're dealing with right now could very much be just a, around learning how to accept what's happening. You know, we don't want this to, you know, continue to be like this forever, but accepting it and being able to deal with it anyway and still live our lives and still, you know, you know, still create things, still go for goals um, still set those goals, make plans, plan in pencil now, you know, plan in pencil because sometimes we don't know, you know, what's around the corner with a lockdown or whatever, but to still kind of rise above the circumstances that we're in. So building that mindset to be able to deal with that. And of course, resilience is a big word, um, but just being able to recognize where you're at, I think with your feelings and emotions and also just then, you know, being able to, you know, plan for what's next. So, Kevin, so let me ask you this. And it may be a bit of a selfish question, but I know there's a whole lot of people like me, and maybe you were, I don't know. That's why I'm going to ask the question. Is if when someone says to you, like when I was first handed a book that's up there in my required reading now called The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz, it was the first book of that type that I'd ever been asked to read, a success book, a motivation book. And and, and so I would even throw any sort of mindset coaching or training or books or education or whatever that is in the field that you're describing I used to roll my eyes at it I (laughs) used to think oh that sort of stuff is what Amway people read Um, and so I used to poo poo it right in my and and I I, I think I was too clever for that that if I I'll save my 20 bucks. If I'm motivated enough to go and buy the stupid motivational book, I'll save my 20 bucks because I'm already motivated. And I scoffed at it. So I didn't see the value in it. Is there anything you would say to those folks that would kind of have the, the per, maybe the person who rolls their eyes at mindset just by the very nature of the topic of this web stream, maybe that repelled them already. I don't know. But what would you say to that new person who 
valued maybe having new skills in their world that say, yeah, I can see why you've got a volleyball coach. Of course, you've got to learn how to bump, set, spike, whatever the wording is. Um, you, of course, you've got to be in phenomenal physical shape to be able to outlast physically those competitors. But did you really need the guy to go, you can do it, girls? You, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, what would you say to the rookie mindset student? Well, I don't, he didn't really ever say, you can do it, girls. <laughs> um, um, I, I've got to say, I was like you as well throughout my journey with, with, with regard to books. So Natalie was often sitting across, you know, the room in her bed and reading a lot of mindset books. And I would often just, you know, read books to entertain me because mindset's not just about learning through a book. It's learning through experience. And I felt that um, when I was actually playing the sport, when I was in the situation, I was gaining so much knowledge about the situation that my mind was just completely full. And I needed the downtime to be able to just kind of relax and release. So everybody is different. Like just be aware that everybody is different. So if you don't like reading books, absolutely fine. Do it in another way. So I found the experience, like doing things, like the glass walking, the fire walking, the pushing myself out of my comfort zone, and I'll answer that question in a sec. Um, I think that that Naomi wrote um, about pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, but I found those things strengthened my mindset. So pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, how do you know when you're out of it? Well, yes, it's the the, the heart is beating. It's it's the uncertainty. It's the unknown. It's the um, maybe the you know you you're pissed off with what's going on you know you don't understand what's happening next that's all uncomfortable stuff you don't know what's around the corner that's what you know that's when you know you're being you know doing something uncomfortable it might just be brushing your teeth with your left hand it might just be taking a different track you know um on your run or a different path on your way to work or something like that just being uncomfortable and getting used to it so um, going back to your question, what do you say to those people? Like, just find a way that you can improve yourself what, what, that works for you, whether it's reading a book, watching a video, or actually experiencing those uncomfortable things. Um, but yeah, I was definitely, definitely like you. <laughs> wow. Isn't that interesting that, you know, what you've said in very real, practical, experiential terms, you said what the psychology people would I'm sure say when they talk about people who are visual, who learn visually through uh, through you know either reading or, or graphics or or watching. For me, I'm a very auditory person, meaning I love audible, listening to podcasts, listening. You know, if I'm in education mode, if I'm going for a walk. I'm listening to someone educating, motivating, or whatever the case may be. But for you, that's the kinesthetic. That's the, you've got the audio, the visual, the kinesthetic. For you, it was experiential learning, that getting in there and doing and experimenting and being in those, those moments, that's the best way that you learn. So in a, yeah. in a real estate sense, that would be role-playing rather than listening to someone doing their sales presentation. They'll be role-playing it. They'll be doing lots and lots and lots of them and then analyzing your performance after the presentation to see where it could be improved, et cetera. So, and, actually, mm. and actually doing the real ones, actually going out there and just getting started and not just being, not just keeping on getting ready to get ready sort of thing, not just keeping on doing all the preparation, but actually not trying it, yeah. getting out there and, and putting your L plates on, you know, which we had to do when we were trying new things on the beach and playing the best teams in the world, we had our L plates and then our P plates. And then eventually we got our full license and, you know, and then you can be your best and, and drive around the track and try and beat all those, you know, those crazy other people. But, you know, it's, it's just, I, I love the experience experience part, but you've got to be able to be okay with failing as well. When you start doing stuff like that, you've got to be okay with, you know, being, not making a fool of yourself because you don't want to do that intentionally because that that kind of is not a nice feeling, but you've kind of got to be okay with those sorts of instances, I guess. Um, and, you know, when you look at our sport in particular, volleyball or beach volleyball, every point is a win or a loss, every single point. And I don't know how many points, so let me think. So in a really long match, 24, you could be playing about 150 to 200 points. In a very quick match, it could be only about 60 or, or 50 even points. So something like that. So imagine 50, to, the minimum, like say 50 points. Um, 
some of those you're going to lose and some of those you're going to win, you know. And so we got very, you know, in our sport, we get very used to losing. And it's often how you react to losing or how you react to anything in life is how you're, you know, whether you're able to then move forward and, and get a little bit better. So that's a mindset thing. And I remember being on tour and in the beginning of playing with Natalie and I was the, the senior player and the more experienced player had a big spike. Everyone was serving Natalie because they thought that they would get more points off Natalie. And, as Nat and that was great because Natalie just got better and better and better with experience being served and having to dig and, and, and spike and finish the point off. Um, but what then happened after a couple of years, people, we were, and we started to win, was that people were like, okay, we better try Kerry. Let's see if she can handle a whole match of being served at. And when I started being served, I took that as offence. I thought, oh, my God, everybody thinks I'm the weaker player now. And my ego was like a little bit damaged. And I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And what it did was make me actually lose points for our team. And so people kept on serving me, which, again, was a great thing because it made me stronger. So what I learned through that experience was just to toughen up and to really just be okay with all the failure and be okay with losing points and not lose one or two points in a row. Because I remember I was so frustrated that everybody started serving me. I asked my coach, I said, why are people serving me? What is it that I'm not able to do um, that makes them think they can get points off me? And he said, do you really want to know? And I said, yeah, please tell me. And he just looked me in the eye and said, Kerry, it's because you don't just lose one point you lose two or three or sometimes four points for us in a row. And that hit me like a brick. And when it was pointed out to me, so this is the first thing, recognising, you know, where you're at and recognising your weaknesses. When it was pointed out to me, I'm like, damn it, that's not going to happen again. So straight away, my mind went to, no, nope, I'm not going to let that happen. And so my mindset shifted to the next level. And then, I, you know, every time I'd lost a point, I'd, you know, give it everything else, you know, a whole lot more to make sure I wouldn't lose another point in a row. And it didn't always happen, but that was the switch. So you can see that mindset is so many different things. And a lot of it is around, um, you know, how you react to certain instances. And, you know, there have been a few moments in my athletic career and you know, in the last 20 years since Sydney, obviously, gold medal, um, where I've used strategies to actually flip how I was feeling so I, my reactions would be different and then my reactions would then cause physical actions and then I could be on my way again. Let me ask you this because I tell you, this is going to be a selfish question, but then maybe me asking this question when I need some help, we can in turn help others who feel like me. So I love what you've just said because I've, I've often thought about that that say a basketballer, top level NBA basketballer, when they miss a shot, that game is bang straight back into it. They cannot let that thing even affect that failure, that mini failure, even affect them for five seconds. Same as your thing. If you lose a point, then you lose another, then another, then that's, that's horrible. You need to snap like that. For me, adversity, like say I get a client, um, it's not often clients, it's often non-clients who've never done any business with me, have a sook about me online and complain about whatever it is that I'm doing. If I have someone who expressly says, I've done something wrong in either business or personally or whatever the case may be, it can affect me for days. Not only not, like, I sh like ideally, it'll definitely affect me for the rest of the day. And whilst the rest of the day won't be a write-off, I will be performing suboptimally because I'll be thinking, how can that person be right? Like I would love, like, is there anything actually physically or some tactic or some strategy that I can practice that'll get the snap to happen? Is it like, is there anything you can add that like, what did you do when you became realizing like, how the hell do you go from someone who in, at an unconscious level does Sook, in your case, for four points, that might be 10 minutes. That might be four minutes. I don't know however long those points can be. For me, that's four days or minimum four hours. How do we, how do, we do it so we can step back when maybe we are, and I certainly am, and I, I, I live and breathe and react a lot on emotion, both positive and negative. Is there anything you can add to the person who sooks for a half a day upon a, 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 a challenge? Yeah. Okay. So I just had to write three things down so I wouldn't forget them because I've got three examples as you were kind of talking about that and, and with your question. So, okay. Going back to Sydney 2000, I'll give you an example. A lot of people said to us, how did you cope with 
2,000 screaming fans. Now, let me just explain. Like, you're in this, like, it's almost you're in um, a coliseum and everybody's, like, above you in these seats and then down in the middle in this beautiful little um, rectangle of these four people in bikinis and, you know, there's 10,000 screaming people around you and there's not much space between the court and the, and the, the beginning of the stand, you know. And when you think about how every time you win a point, 10,000 people cheering for you because they've obviously 90% of them were on our side. It was just like, yeah, really, really loud. But imagine when those 10,000 people, like how they felt when you lost a point. They felt really sorry for you. So they went, oh, and mm. that's also really, really loud because they're right next to you. So we were on this roller coaster of emotions in the beginning and it was really difficult we managed to to get through it over over time and talking to other people talking to a sports psych who helped us a little bit but the one question people asked was didn't you feel the pressure playing in Sydney in front of everybody else and the first thing because we are we're conditioned to to, to make this flip almost immediately in our minds we often said to people no we use their energy to lift us up onto the podium so that was just an automatic response to that question. Now, at the time, it didn't feel like that because at the time the knees were shaking. You know, we needed to go to the toilet 15 times before the match started. We were so nervous. Um, but what we did straight after our first match, which we actually nearly lost because we were that nervous, we went and spoke to people who had already done what we were doing, came back to Australia perhaps from being an international superstar, playing in Australia, having the whole country, you know, on their shoulders, willing them to win. We went to somebody in the Olympic Village the day after we nearly lost our first match. We had some time and we talked to him and his name is Pat Rafter, an Australian yeah. tennis player. Of course. And we said, yeah. what Queensland is it like? icon. <laughs> yeah. And we said, what was it like when you came back to Australia after winning the US Open and then being at the Australian Open and having that pressure? We need some help. So we just sat down with this guy. So the first lesson there is go to people who are feeling what you're feeling and perhaps doing what you want to do and ask them their advice. Ask them how they dealt with it. Um, and so we, we got this, we had a great conversation with him and a lot of the other tennis players, Leighton Hewitt and a few of the girls. And, um, you know, the one thing I took from, from Pat was he said, make it feel like you and Natalie are in this kind of cocoon and, you know, the crowds around you, you can kind of hear them, but you're not really listening. And I, in my mind, I kind of felt like a, a cone of silence, you know, like get smart. You've got the cone of silence. <laughs> You're aging us, girl. You're aging us. <laughs> no, no, they had the Get Smart movie just a few years ago. The oh, did, movie. They, did that have a so, cone of silence in it? <laughs> probably. But let's say we, we have this cone of silence around us. It was made of glass. I kind of felt like that had been building game by game. And then obviously in the gold medal match, when the last ball landed out, and I hit the ground. If you see the photos, you've got some photos behind me, but I haven't got the photo of when I hit the ground and Natalie fell on top of me. And I felt like at that time it was the glass was just shattering down around us. Um, and all of a sudden I looked up and I could see the faces on the crowd. So I built this cone of silence around me. So the lesson there obviously is speak to people. Um, the other thing I wanted to share was um, totally not sport. Uh, back in, you know, just around 2000, I split up with um, a boyfriend that I'd been on and off with for a while. And, you know, for me, it was a really hard time to get through that emotionally. And, you know, I was starting to bring stuff to training and, you know, my, our mindset coach, he, he really helped me in that. Um, he said to me, you know, when you step into that rectangle at training, everything, all my personal life, all my emotion, everything that, you know, wasn't going to serve me on the court, live outside of that box. So I used that trying that rectangle, the triangle, use the rectangle as, you know, the, the line, once I stepped over that line in the sand, you know, I was focused on just what I had to do. When I stepped back out again, I could kind of, you know, get back into the rest of my life. So I guess the lesson there is if you have to focus on something and there's a lot of crap going on around you is find somewhere that you can just put your little blinkers on um, and use that as, um, you know, maybe it's closing a door to your office or maybe it's um, putting your earphones in or whatever the actual action is. Use that as the action that switches you into gear, gets, you know, those negative thoughts out. 
Um, but during this time, I also had a friend who was one of my sponsors, actually. And we were out on a boat in St Kilda and doing some water skiing. And the whole time I was, I was kind of trying to be happy, but I was always talking about this guy who I'd just broken up with. And eventually he said to me, the sponsor said to me, Kerry, you know what? It's a long time in a pine box. And basically it hit me like, like a fist in the face. You know, the longer I continue to focus on and, and worry and talk about all the things that weren't going you know, well in my life, which was the relationship, the longer it would take me to move on and the less of my life I could live, you know, happily. So think of that again when stuff's not going well and you want to make that, that change. It's a long time in a behind box. That sentence has stayed with me for over 20 years and I keep on reminding myself whenever something happens, you know, it's okay. You know, sometimes I say it to myself, but it's a bit kind of gruesome, but it is a long time in a pine box, just a, a, a memory. And then... The third thing that I wanted to share with you, so some of you may or may not know, I've just completed, well, a few months ago, completed filming SAS Australia, and it's coming on screen on Channel 7 um, in September. And for those of you who don't know the show, you basically um, handed over, a group of us are handed over to four SAS, former SAS soldiers, um, they're UK soldiers, not Australian soldiers, but it doesn't matter. They're still SAS they're still soldiers. Brutal. <laughs> and it's brutal. They put you through a selection course. And, you know, there's no holds barred. There's no producers at the side going, oh, can you shoot that again? We didn't get that. It is absolutely 100% authentic and real. And um, leading into this show, I was quite, um, I don't know, I guess I was really worried whether physically I could handle it I'm I was 55 I'm 56 now but I you know being mid 50s I hadn't really um, done much physically I, I obviously trained in the, the 11 weeks leading up once I realized I was going to go on it once I made that decision which is a whole nother story making a decision of doing something crazy <laughs> um, there were people half my age there were guys that were you know six or five and built like this um, you know, I knew that I'd have my work cut out for me. I knew that there were going to be some really harrowing moments and I was starting to really doubt myself and really doubt whether physically I'd be ready. And I've still got it stuck up behind my computer, but I want to read this to you. So what I did, and I've done this three major times in my, my life, and this, was the, this is the third time, when, I, when things weren't going well for me and I had all, my head was just completely full of the negativity and completely full of fear and doubt, I wrote down all my fears and doubts on a piece of paper. I wrote down everything I thought was thinking that could like keep me out of the game, that, that you know, could just lead to um, failure, all right? So all my fears and doubts on one piece of paper. Then I got another piece of paper and on that piece of paper, I flipped everyone. I flipped them to the positive. And I ended up with a mantra. So this is my mantra. And I printed it in different colours. And I put it all around my house. I had it on my bathroom mirror. Every morning I'd be brushing my teeth, I'd be reading my mantra. or my, I call it my creed or something, whatever you want to call it. Affirmations. But it's a whole kind of like but a paragraph like, long one yeah got it had it in the kitchen had it next to my bed i had it everywhere i read it multiple times a day and that's the important part you can write this stuff out but unless you put it where you can see it then it's not going to have the same effect so i'm going to read it to you and just feel where this came from so this came from really a whole lot of fear and doubt and this is what i i came up with I'm ready, I'm strong, I've got grit and determination. I welcome the challenge, I thrive in this environment. My knees are strong, my knees are stable, my knees are ready to smash this out. I'm healthy, I'm fit, I'm emotionally ready, my age is an advantage, I'm experienced and resilient, I'm a valued team member, I'm loved by all, I welcome the cold as I breathe through it with ease. I feel the pain. I'm okay with the pain. I'm here by choice. I'm going to be fine. My boots feel like slippers. My feet are tough. My legs will carry me with strength and grace. I will not be last. I will not quit. I am ready. I am doing this. So that 
was, I swear that was what got me to the start line. Like the last three days, I reckon I was, before I started this course, I was crying every day. I was so worried that my knees wouldn't hold out. I'd had a few issues in the lead up training wise. Um, so yeah, my biggest, biggest piece of advice, whenever you're feeling the fear and the doubt, write it down, flip it, and then make yourself a little creed that you can look at every single day and that just puts you in the right mindset, another mindset strategy to then just go about doing what you have to do that day. Wow. Wow. That's powerful. And I love how what, what you were saying about um, your saying of the pine box one that really resonated with me. And I, I tell you, I've letting it fall since I moved to WA here. I brought my bookshelf, which again, for me, I don't read as many books as I used to. But this bookshelf is a is a trigger for me but I remember in my office yes I got the bookshelf going because I knew that was important to me even if I never read another one of them because now what I do is I'll buy the book but I'll buy it on audible as well one for the bookshelf and one that I actually consume which is the audible I never even read the book like <laughs> Jordan Peterson's last two books bought them never opened them because I listened to them but um but but I had this thing on my wall my version of the pine boxes forever you know it's a long time in the box I felt the same thing in some way. So I got a photo because there's all the positive ones. So on my wall of my last office, I had a photo of Arnold Schwarzenegger working me out at Gold's Gym, right? Beautiful, <laughs> iconic photo that is the highlight of my life because he's been my hero since I was a kid. So that was the what's possible in a positive sense. But when I was sooking, my pine box thing was Jesse Ventura in Predator saying, I haven't got time to bleed. So that was my kind of reminder that when I'm sooking, you haven't got time to soak, dude. So I've got to get that visual stimu stimulus back up. But, but I yeah. love even yeah. more important, that mantra being everywhere multiple yeah. times a day. I love that personally yeah. written that you wrote that. No one else wrote that for you. You wrote exactly. that. Exactly. And it, and it comes from your fears. That's the important thing. Because you can write all that stuff out, you know, copy what other people have written or whatever, but you've got to, it's got to come from what your fear and your doubt is. And now I've started using um, whiteboard markers on my mirror in my bathroom, which I'd not really done before I was sticking things up, but I'm starting to write on the mirror. Um, and I'm getting into coaching and I've been coached to be a coach like a one-on-one -on -one coach um, and I've just got you know on my mirror at the moment I'm an amazing coach I do it with effort and ease so you know it just depends where you're at in life you can rub it out and you can change it the next week and but it's just it's about seeing it all the time yeah so um, let me ask you about that because I was sitting there thinking oh as, as you were reading yours I'm sitting there going Kerry, what, what would mine be? You know, so I was thinking if someone was feeling the same way I was and wanted, I don't know, some help, have you got time? Like if you're doing some coaching and things, how can our crew find you if they wanted, I mean, heaven forbid, when I saw you give a motivational keynote speech, that was incredible. So what are you filling your time with and what have people got able to, you know, get some of that gold medal, you know, igniting that gold medal spirit in their business. And they wanted to sort of have you as part of their team. As you said, you first thing you did was you assembled your team, performance coach, skills coach, sports psychologist, mindset coach, if they wanted you to be part of their team for either them or their team, what would they do? Um, well, I'm doing a lot of Zooms, obviously, which is awesome in a way. It's, and it's shitty in another way, because I love the personal interaction I love the the feedback from the people in the audience so I love speaking been doing it for 20 years so hopefully when um you know everything opens up we can get back on stages again but right now virtual gives me the opportunity at a much lower cost for the the client um to get me into their their teams and just talk about my experiences you know talk about some of the stories that I did I mean the stories that I've shared with you this morning are just a tiny tiny bit of of what I have um, and people can just get th get to me through social media or through my website or my email is kerry at kerrypodcast.com, pretty easy. Um, and I can either come in and zoom into your meetings at businesses. You can just contact me and we'll just talk about, you know, how much that will be at a pretty reduced, we'll get the Glenn Twiddle discount. Um, <laughs> Um, or one-on-one -on -one coaching, absolutely. I've started one-on-one -on -one coaching and it's all about the art of human high performance. So high performance, I don't mean from a sporting point of view. It just means that, you know, I've spent 20 years perfecting like my mindset 
and I've had to come back from injury, come back from relationship breakdowns, come back from or get over, um, you know, retiring from a sport that was full time. Like I've, I've been through so much. So I've put together a bunch of strategies to help. And I have a four week program. Um, that people can come and join me on. And uh, again, I can and talk to you about a Glenn Twiddle discount. Uh, but normally my program is $2,000 plus GST for four weeks. Unlimited emails, you know, you become my friend um, and we work really, really closely together to help you um, create your dreams and get you through your fears and doubts and, and get you through where we are at the moment, get you focusing on stuff that makes you happy um, and that, and also, if, it, if you want to, we can talk about movement and nutrition, because obviously that's a big part of who I am as an athlete. Um, I can help you in those areas. I'm not an expert, but of course, I've been, you know, surrounded by experts all my life and I can draw from experts or recommend experts to you if you need them. Um, but for me, it's all about helping you design the life that you want, be the architect of your own life. Wow. And um, I tell you, it's... Um you know, for those of us, and that's all of us, that's me, that's everyone listening. I love that what you've got the opportunity to do, and again, at a discounted rate, guys, you could never normally afford this. What Pat Rafter and Leighton Hewitt and those Olympians, when she's in the Olympic village, got to lean on legend status. Well, now you get to lean similarly on Kerry now that she's sort of flipped that role. She was once the person leaning on legends to become one herself. Now you get the chance to lean on her as part of your team. And I tell you, your life won't be the same should you choose to do so. So avail yourself of that. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah, well, I've seen it firsthand. I've seen friends of mine take you up on that years ago, like Ivor Thomas. I'm sure you know Ivor. Um, you know, he did that and he was, he's been singing your praises for probably for five years it's been <laughs> years and um even this even when i i put out a little post saying um just publicly on facebook saying hey we, we've got kerry this tuesday i've all i saw him tag someone else and say lisa they had a meeting said lisa we're going to cancel that meeting kerry's talking so <laughs> Yay, so, hi, <laughs> so um so yeah so certainly uh, and i remember he he did take you up on that offer he lost crap load of weight he got into supreme physical condition he's still riding bikes at a <laughs> and he competitive... just commented <laughs> oh did he oh, I mean, he's, he's on here now and he said it's true um so yeah so you'd be doing yourself a massive favor to at least inquire with kerry see what she's up to see what she can do either privately one-on-one -on -one, with a group with a team uh you guys if your principal licensee needed to connect with kerry uh kerry at kerrypothouse.com uh do avail yourself of um of that opportunity so uh um, Kerry, thank you so much for today. Um, amazing. Uh, what sort of um, what sort of COVID message would you would you leave our folks with? Meaning, you sort of touched on it uh, earlier that we are in unprecedented uh, environmental times, and meaning just the world we live in, our environment. It seems like the pressure cooker has been dialed up on all of us that we can't open our phones to see what we are and aren't allowed to do on that given day without seeing a hundred of our friends and colleagues fighting over whether or not to do X or do Y and our behaviors being challenged, our political beliefs are being challenged. Like our world is being challenged all at the same time. We're trying to just stay in a job, stay sane, stay competing. What would be, you know, your, your final parting message for your, for, you know, for, for our crew here in these unique specific times? Yeah, funny you should ask that. I actually wrote something down um, the other day and I just saw it on my desk and I thought, oh, I've got to read it. So I'm going to put my, my old people glasses on. <laughs> yeah. um, but I wrote down to that we've got to have the ability to be optimistic, but also the discipline to face the facts as they are now and make the most of it. I thought that was really, really cool. So be optimistic but have the discipline to face the facts. So the discipline is obviously put, putting boundaries around, you know, how often you open your social media and how often you look at, you know, I've stopped looking at all the 11 o'clock updates here in Sydney. I stopped that months ago, um, you know, but I still have the discipline to just look at one news report. Actually, I have one person on, on Instagram and she summarises it every day. So I just look at that and go, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> 
Um, uh-huh. Instead of feeling like if you get in, if you get involved in, in watching all that stuff, you just start to feel really bad. And remember, this is affecting our mental health. So it's really important to be disciplined and have the faith that we will prevail in the end. Things will get better in the end, but we just don't know when that will be. So be, be okay with that. At first, it's hard to accept because I hate uncertainty as well, but be okay, have the faith. What can I do today? Ask yourself, what can I do today that I will thank my, myself for post-COVID? So what can you do for yourself today? And that doesn't have to mean, doesn't mean you have to learn something or listen to an audio book or, you know, become the expert at this. It could just mean, like, look after you. It could just mean self-care or self-love, you know, have a rest, use this time to just, you know, have a holiday, have a rest from the hard work you've been doing for years. It could be that that's exactly what you need. It it could be that you, you need to be there for somebody else and be their rock, you know, whatever that is. And be enchanted with life. I love this. Be enchanted with life. Don't see the world through the printed headlines. Write your own headlines. Now, I copied a bit of that from different places, but I thought that they, they were pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, write your own headlines. I think that's probably the, the best line to, to finish up on. Well, if you stole it from someone else, I'm stealing it from you. i got pen and paper. You're never going to catch me <laughs> with someone like you without pen and paper taking notes. So I've got a page of write-me's here, Kerry, uh, with my eternal thanks that there's definitely some things that I need to do, you know, in order to to do better. So gang, before we let it go, let's uh, see, we've got a a question or two. There's certainly one there, Kerry. I'm sure you're seeing that now, Kerry. How does someone treat food? This is a good one. This is good for me too, Amanda. Thank you for asking this. How does someone treat food as energy for the body only and not enjoy eating for joy? And and that is, I definitely have recognized, I use food as an endorphin dump that I eat, overeat, and then uh, that's at an unconscious level, I must know at some physiological level that overeating gives a sense of, uh, thank God. Great question, Amanda. Karen, and then la- what are your and then thoughts? Later on, and then later on, you feel like crap and you wish you hadn't. Um, Absolutely. This, again, I'm going to put my glasses on because I want to make sure I answer the question. But this is a great opportunity, Amanda, for you to flip how you feel about eating, because obviously you feel that eating, that that it's bad to eat for joy. It's not bad to eat for joy. It's actually great to eat for joy. So flip the, the, the doubt around how you think about eating to, I love eating. Eating brings me great joy. I love sitting down. I love devouring a, a, a warm meal with my family. Whatever it is you love about eating or you love snacking or whatever it is, but actually make it, I love eating and snacking on really good nutritious food. So don't talk about the, the, the food that's bad for us and, and puts the weight on. Don't talk about that. Don't put that in your whatever your musings are or your writings are. Put the good stuff in. What do you want to focus on? You want to focus on joy of eating. I love eating too. And I eat bad things every now and again, bad things. But don't see them as bad things. See the fact that eating is about eating nutritious, good food and that there are nutritious, good foods that actually taste great. There definitely are. Find the ones that are good for you. Eat to your heart's desire for joy, um, but make it nutritious food. And then you'll get the energy that you need, right? You'll get it. Absolutely. Yeah, beautiful. Good question, Amanda. And certainly that's a, a lesson for me. Like I've been, uh, I've been like Oprah with my weight. It's been up, it's been down, it's been up, it's been down. And I certainly have recognized the challenge. And so, yeah, you know, we've all got our own path and journey that we're working on. And I love, you know, definitely for me, the calling in of experts and, and being good and coachable has been one of my keys to success. I've, I've, when I ask someone's opinion, I, I don't just, second guess their opinion because I know they're more, you know, in every facet of my life, when a mentor who I've asked questions for, I'll never ask the question if I'm only wanting one answer that I like, you know, I'll do, you know, I'll take, and actually, Kerry, did I see that you did that with, um, as part of your SAS training and guys, when this shows on, we got to watch, we got to cheer. Is there a voting process that we can help you on or is it just, no, it's just, we're being voyeuristic. Okay. No, we, uh, we, we leave when we've had enough. 
basically. Uh, okay, so you ring the bell like in the in the um, yeah, Navy pretty Seals. much. We, we rip our numbers off when we've had enough. Oh, uh, so, cool. So yeah. I look forward to that. But you reached out to Biggest Loser Train and Shannon, um, yeah. uh, if I saw correctly, as part of your physical preparation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the first thing I did when I made that decision that I would take on this crazy challenge, and people ask me why did I do it, and the, you know, obviously I love the challenge. I love. I love to have something to work towards. I love a goal. And this gave me a really great physical goal to work towards. I knew that I'd get smashed on the show. <laughs> but it was a, it, the journey to get there, that 11 weeks, just reminded me how incredible our bodies are because I started to focus on um, my nutrition. I started to focus on training again. I started to focus specifically on strength training. Now, I said I'm 55 years old and, you you know, most 55-year-old women would not even contemplate lifting a weight or would not even think that they, they, may, have, they may have done it in their 20s but would, would think that they're over the hill. Well, I did it because I wanted to prove that there's no such thing as over the hill. There's no such thing as like, um, you know, it, the best is behind us or, or whatever those age related type you know sayings are I wanted to like go from a, an, an unfit body and I swear I was unfit because I hadn't trained for years and years and years I might look lean but that's just my constitution and I don't kind of you know I don't fatten up um easily I'm six foot tall and I've just come from a, a very tall lean family but I was unfit and I didn't have a lot of strength. And so I'd lost a lot over the years. So to get strong again was really exciting. But the first thing I did when I realized that I was going to do this was who's going to be on my team? What do I need to get to where I want to go? And the first thing I thought of was I have to talk to people who've done it. So um, Shannon Ponton lives in the same area as me. I'd been on The Biggest Loser. Natalie and I went on The Biggest Loser once and met him and, and I've seen him a couple of times since. So I just contacted him through social media and bang straight away. He was like, yep, let's meet up, phone call. And then we had a, a meet up and he, he got me up on his shoulder and he taught me how to do a, like a fireman's carry in the cafe, on the side street in front of a cafe. It was hilarious. I'm going to put those photos on social media <laughs> later. Um, and then, the, then I wanted a girl's point of view. So I went to Shana Jack, a swimmer, and then, um, I, one more person I thought I needed someone kind of a different point of view as well and I knew Candace um, used to be Candace Fausen but now Candace Warner David Warner's wife she was also on there and and so I wanted to get three different like variations of, of their experience which I did get like the, the three you know told me very different things or well, not different but just from their points of view so it really got me you know understanding again it's mindset it's like as soon as you know a little bit more about where you want to go and what you need to do, like the things you have to do to get there, it gives you some confidence and that's mindset. So find the people that have done what you want, you know, if, if, find, talk, to, talk to the people who have done it and learn from them and find little bits of what they've done that suit you, which is why I spoke to three of them, not just one. Mm, I love that it was Jim Rowan that said, um, you know, your success, he was talking about income, admittedly, but certainly whatever it is that you want to achieve in life will be the average aggregate of the five people you have in your clique, in your team, You've, you know, your most closest, you know, be it team members, be it colleagues, be it friends, be it whatever the case may be. So, you know, and I've certainly found that to be true, that I sort of, you know, before you jumped on, Kerry, I was going through a little bit of nothing special about me, working class background, never done anything more than a $40,000 a year job prior to, you know, deciding to have a crack at age sort of 29, 30. Um, and I've surrounded myself with, you know, with, with people, let's say better than me in the various fields that I wanted to be good at. And just almost through osmosis and action that, you know, you do start to, the, the team you assemble will start to dictate where it is you end up. So certainly I love that guys, you know, something that, Many of us, certainly early in my career, I couldn't afford that sort of thing. Having someone like Kerry Podhast on my team uh, to be able to call in, well, she can be on your team to call in as part of her unique skill sets because it's more than one. She's got all of these different skills and tactics to add to your uh, world. Um, avail yourself of that. Emails Kerry at kerrypodhast.com. I'll put that up on the screen when we have the recording to distribute. And um, But yeah, follow her on social at the very least as we're watching the new SAS show to follow along with the commentary on social because I'm sure that is going to be a wild, wild ride. And I can't wait, Kerry. Thank you <laughs> for today. Um, thank you so, so much. It's been a, an honor getting to know you, um, you know, for years now. 
um, again, for you guys who haven't, you know, I mentioned before that I want it all deal. My life's work for 50 bucks. That includes a keynote talk from Nat and Kerry at the, um, the Arnold Schwarzenegger event that we did some years ago uh, down in Sydney. These guys were a major hit. Uh, the crowd loved what they had to, to teach. And that was a lot of fun. And I uh, thank you for everything you've done for us as a, as a community, Kerry. Thank you. Pleasure. See you later, guys. Have a great, awesome day. Until next time, Kerry. See you later. Bye for Ciao. now. And there she is. What a champion that woman is. Remember, if you wanted to have Kerry herself hold your hand, mentor you through, just email Kerry at kerrypothouse.com and uh, see if she has some availability left because she her time has been massively in demand since the uh, the SAS show, since the um, the Olympics just recently. So she's certainly an in demand. Uh, professional coach and uh, media personality, but certainly her availing herself some of uh, her time for us is really, really grateful both on this podcast, but maybe, just maybe, for you in a uh, in a more intimate capacity working with Kerry as part of her, uh, her world. So uh, I do uh, encourage you to take advantage and investigate more on whether or not to have Kerry her, herself personally as part of your team. And until next time, remember the next part three of this three-part series here on Real Estate Renegades, we're talking about mindset. And next week, the 14-year-old phenom, who's now, I've known him now for five years, so he's now just turned 19, but Caleb Maddox, the man who had earned a million dollars before he was 16, that young man joins us next week here on Real Estate Renegades. Wow. Well, there you go. I hope you liked the episode. If you liked that, then what you need to do is you need to subscribe. You need to get more of this craziness because we got more are coming. Uh, I'm never standing still and we've got so many more guests, we've got so many more strategies, more out of the box thinking. So if you haven't subscribed, literally, you're like throwing away thousands of dollars. So I tell you, if you haven't subscribed, you don't come back, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find you, I'm going to market to you and I'm going to charge you for the very stuff that on this podcast we give away for free. So whack that subscribe button on whatever your favourite podcast uh, weapon of destruction is and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye for now.